Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we're going to be talking about YouTube paying creators to promote their Twitch-like features. We're going to talk about Facebook being pressured into decrypting their Messenger app and a whole lot more. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings. Welcome back to episode 132 of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is What I Says. Like always, there are timestamps in the description and show notes so you can skip around to whatever topic you want to hear me discuss. But if you got time, I'd suggest listening to the entire episode. Let's dive right into this stuff. So first up, this is a report that comes from Bloomberg, and it is that YouTube is paying creators tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands of dollars to promote their monetization features. And these features that they are paying to be promoted are their paid memberships, the Super Chat feature, and the new merchandising shelf. So according to Bloomberg, this contract between YouTube and the creators does not require the creators to only upload or exclusively upload to YouTube, but they are required to post to YouTube first. That is the only requirement that we are fully aware of. So what does this news story really mean for us creators? Nothing. We are likely the smaller creators. So first up, a lot of us don't even have access to these features. And secondly, YouTube isn't going to be paying us millions of dollars, or I should say hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even $1,000 to promote these features. So right up front, this has no real impact on us. But I think this allows us to have a conversation about YouTube's new monetization tools because that does potentially impact us in the future. So I think that these new features are great for YouTube to be rolling out because it is allowing us to reach an audience for potential monetization. And what I mean by that is there are likely viewers that we have as creators who use YouTube exclusively. They don't know what Patreon is. They don't know what Twitch is. They don't know what all these external merchandising platforms are. And that may make them not want to contribute to us on those platforms. So by having these features built into YouTube, we may be getting people to, I guess, contribute to us on that platform. I hope that made sense. I think it did. So diving a little bit further, I I don't think that these tools should be used exclusively, though. And this is something that I've been screaming about for months, maybe years. (laughs) And that would be that I, I think these new features from YouTube should be used to supplement external income streams. And you should still have your Patreon, you should still have your Twitch, you should should still have your Facebook Live, your merch platforms, your audiobooks, your paid courses, all of these different revenue streams. You should still have those. You should just be using these YouTube income streams to supplement those so you can reach your potential audience or your audience that does exclusively use YouTube and Google services. Now, I suppose I should elaborate a little bit on this. And the reason I'm saying it is, what if you exclusively were to be using YouTube's monetization tools and you say something that YouTube hates? We've seen this in the past where YouTube says, okay, you no longer get to use AdSense. What if you are relying solely on YouTube for all of your income streams? Now, not only will you face losing your AdSense, but you also risk losing your subscriptions, your live streaming income, and your main traffic source for your merchandise. So again, this is something I've said, I think pretty much every single week. You need to have a a hub that you personally own. For me, I am still working on developing it and, and flushing it out, but bandrewscott.com, I got creatorcasestudy.com, I got bandrewsays.com, I got geeksrising.com, I got a bunch of different platforms that I personally own. So if YouTube says, we don't like the fact that you're discussing the Alex Jones news stories, we're going to demonetize you or remove all of your channels. People can still, or I can still direct people to those URLs and direct them to whatever platform I'm on now. And on those websites, I'm able to link to other monetization and income sources for myself. So it's all about making sure that if one income stream dries up, you got another one over here. So I don't think that this news story has any direct impact on us, but I think it was a good time to remind you, diversify, 
And also, if you do get access to it, go ahead and open it up and see if there are some viewers of your channel and of your content that want to support you as a creator. Next up, we got, we're jumping right into security news here. And this is that Facebook is being pressured to break Messenger's encryption for the MS-13 investigation. So according to Reuters or Reuters, I think it's Reuters, if I remember correctly, the US government is trying to force Facebook to break the encryption in its popular messenger app so law enforcement may listen to a suspect's voice conversations in a criminal probe. So Reuters sources who are anonymous also stated that the judge heard arguments that will hold Facebook in contempt of court for refusing to carry out the surveillance request. Now, I do believe the way that end-to-end -end encryption works is the person sending the message and the person receiving the message are the only two parties who have the decryption key. And that means that if anybody were to intercept the message in the middle, all they would get would just be random information. They would have no way of deciphering what was said in those messages. And that includes the company in this case. So Facebook has no idea what is said in an end-to-end -end encrypted message. So they would have to completely disable end-to-end -end encryption in order to meet this request from the courts. At least that's my understanding. And anybody who understands this stuff a little bit better, please correct me in the comments. So if this case ends up in the government's favor, then there could be some pretty serious privacy implications in the US. If companies are required to have the ability to meet surveillance requirements, end-to-end -end encryption could cease to exist because if you don't comply with these governmental requests, then you could be held in contempt of court. And the only way to meet these requests would be to kill end-to-end -end encryption or have a man-in-the-middle way of decrypting end-to-end -end encryption, which would make it not end-to-end -end encryption because it could be decrypted in the middle. But I do want to point out that this is the issue with encryption. It does allow citizens the right to privacy, and it is a necessary or very important right for citizens to have. But it also allows criminals that same right to privacy and that avenue to conduct criminal activities. So that is the pickle or the predicament that we're in. You are allowing citizens privacy, but you are also allowing that same right or that same tool for criminals to abuse. So I personally don't have the answers here. I would love to have end-to-end -end encryption forever, but I do understand law enforcement has its own agenda but I don't think that that should infringe on the public's right to privacy. But I do want to hear from you all here. Do you think that end-to-end -end encryption should be eliminated completely in order to meet government surveillance requests? Or do you think that people using this technology to hide their crimes or to conduct their crimes is just a price to pay for having privacy for the general public? Now, moving on to the next story, and it is that Twitter has put Alex Jones in timeout for being a bad boy. That was a really weird way to put it. But Twitter still hasn't fully banned Alex Jones. And I do still like that about Twitter. I do still like that it is a somewhat open platform. They're not trying to limit what people are saying. And I think that is necessary to have at least one platform that isn't going to fall in line with all the other tech platforms. But Twitter did put Alex Jones's account in read-only mode, so he is unable to post anything for, I believe, a seven-day period. He can still send DMs, he can still search the platform, he can still log in, but he is not able to post any new content. So, the tweet that caused this was actually a live video on Periscope, and in this video, he said that people need to have their battle rifles ready at their bedside. Now, I do have the audio file, and I was considering including it here, but seeing what happened with H3H3 last week, I don't really want to include it on YouTube because maybe that will lead to YouTube giving me a strike or banning me or deleting my channel. Now, being that I'm not as big as H3H3, I don't think that I have the clout to go ahead and fight back with them and get my channel reinstated or remove the strike easily. So the policy that was quoted for giving him this suspension was you may not engage in the targeted harassment of someone or incite other people to do so. We consider abusive behavior an attempt to harass, intimidate or silence someone else's voice. So here is my issue with this entire story. Most places have been reporting that Alex Jones said people need to have their battle rifles ready. 
And they completely omitted the part where he says at their bedside, which I think paints a completely different story, a completely different picture. When you're saying you better get your battle rifles ready, that sounds like it's a call to arms, go out there and cause some damage. But if you say you need to have your battle rifles ready at your bedside, that seems like you need to be willing to protect your property. Completely different narratives there. And I think it's a little bit disingenuous to omit that last part of this sentence. Paints a completely different picture in my opinion. But I am sure that there are some really dopey people out there that will misinterpret Alex Jones's video as a call to arms or a call to go out and do something very stupid and very, very dangerous that may actually harm people. But that raises an even bigger question. Do we hold people accountable for the actions of their followers when something they say is misinterpreted? In my opinion, it's a very slippery slope and I don't personally have the answers. I would hate to be held responsible for me saying, I hate mushrooms. Mushrooms are the bane of my existence. And then somebody misinterprets that and goes out and harms people who eat mushrooms. I wouldn't want to be held responsible. Now, I know that's not a direct comparison. I was being a bit hyperbolic or reductio ad absurdum, but I, I think that is a slippery slope where we hold people responsible for people misinterpreting their words. But I do want to hear from you guys here. Do you think that it is justifiable for Alex Jones to be suspended for this statement? And do you think it's disingenuous of news outlets to leave out the last part of that sentence, which I think paints a completely different picture? And that is actually it for the news. It was a surprisingly slow news week. And let's jump right into what I've been testing. And it is the Rode Broadcaster. The reason I'm bringing this up is it is the end of the Rode Broadcaster stint on the Bandrew Says podcast. And I will share brief thoughts here. Uh, it's not too good with plosives. That is a big issue with it. It's got a crispy top end, a little bit sibilant. And it's pretty clean sounding in terms of the self noise, which is good because it is a condenser. Um, but if you do want to know more, you'll have to wait for the full review over on the podcasted YouTube channel. But again, I would love to hear from you guys here. What have you been thinking of this microphone, which I've been using for the last month? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Do you think it sounds great? Do you think it sounds bad? Do you think this is the best sounding microphone I've ever used? Or do you think it sucks? Let me know. Comments on YouTube. Now let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from SP. He says, great show as always. In light of your critical comments on the TSA, I'm interested to know how you would provide commercial passenger air travel security. There's always a better way, and I sense that you might have some ideas. Keep up the great work, SP. SP, thank you very much for the comment. And if you don't know who Stargate Pioneer is, he is the wonderful host of, or co-host, I should say, of Better Podcasting and the Gunna Geek Show. So this is an awesome question, and I will start off by saying... I don't have all the answers. If I did, I would be working at the TSA. Secondly, I will go ahead and throw some links to articles in the show notes and description if you want to read up a little bit more on this. And I'll summarize the statistics from the main article or the main study that a lot of the criticism is based on. So the Department of Homeland Security conducted a series of tests where 70 agents attempted to get potential weapons through TSA security and 67 of those 70 tests got through. So 67 DHS employees or agents were able to bypass security, get through with weapons. And that is a shocking failure rate. So when it comes to improving the quality of the TSA security, I think there are maybe one or two options that I can think of. The first one would be just improve the training. But there's also the potential that maybe TSA agents aren't paid well, so they don't really care about their job. They're just going through the motions. So maybe there needs to be some kind of incentive program put in place to motivate TSA agents to do a better job with screening. Maybe if they get caught, I, I don't think you'd be able to dock their pay. But if they do catch somebody, maybe give them some incentive and make sure that it's not abused. I don't know how you would implement something like that. It's it's really a difficult situation where you want to maintain some privacy and some decency for air travel passengers, but you also want to ensure that they are catching anybody who's trying to sneak in weapons. I don't know. I would love to hear from you in the comments if you have any ideas on how the TSA could improve their success rate. 
but I personally don't have all the answers. Those are two of my thoughts though. And like I said, I'll throw some links in the show notes down below. The second comment comes from 12799 Meduse. And they say ROFL at Jack Thinking Twitter is a platform for a healthy conversation. And it wasn't pressure from the public causing them to delete Jones. It was pressure from a very small but extremely vocal minority. Most Americans probably don't know who Jones is or even care about him. So I do agree that Twitter can be a rather vitriolic and disgusting place for some users. But I do also think that it can be an awesome place for conversations and interactions. Now, I've said this before, and I am sure I will say it a hundred times in the future. If you follow the right people, and if you don't follow hundreds or thousands of people, you're much more likely to have a really nice and enjoyable experience on Twitter. I constantly hear YouTube creators saying, Twitter is my favorite social media platform because it's simply put the best place to interact with my audience and my viewers and find new people, contact them, collaborate with them. It's just a great place for communication if you use it well. I think a lot of the people who complain about Twitter are not using it properly. They're following thousands of people and they're getting involved in conversations that maybe they shouldn't be. You should not be getting into conversations on Twitter about complex social issues because guess what? You're not going to be able to convey your ideas in 240 characters. It's not the proper place for that. So I think if these people were to avoid a lot of those high emotion conversation topics, then they may have a better experience. So I I do appreciate your feedback and uh, I disagree with you somewhat there. The next comment comes from the crazy wabbit for the person asking about an audio interface. Look into one that you did a review on that sold me Behringer UMC 204 HD price is right, but the Midas preamps rock. I had the zoom H6 first and agree the preamps are noisy that limits portability. If the user can save up some pennies, the ultimate get, and I have my eyes on this someday sound devices, mix pre three portable. And from what everyone says, amazing preamps, crazy wabbit. Thank you very much for the feedback and the input here. And I I agree 100% the Mix Pre 3 are supposed to have some of the cleanest, most insane preamps, like 90 decibels of clean gain. So that would future proof you real well. Next comment comes from Flaming Good Media. He says, Audient ID4 is in use here as my main interface. A good entry to the Audient line and totally agree and confirm what Bandrew says here. I use the device for pro voiceover and those preamps are clean, man. I was using the Zoom H5 alongside as my VO booth is away from my editing PC. Again, it's confirmed the preamps are noisier, but Zoom devices are a pro range. Those devices are better suited for work in the field, journo, and maybe recording a concert, etc. So Simon, thank you very much for that input. And I agree out in the field, I think the Zoom would be a good option because you're not gonna be as worried with preamp noise because you have all the ambient noise going on around you. So good insight there and thank you all for your comments. Now let's go ahead and jump into my favorite part of the podcast, the Ask Bandrew segment. Okay, guys, so if you got any questions, go ahead and send them to askbandrew at gmail.com, and I will likely answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. First question comes from Logan. He says, hey, Bandrew, how are you? First off, I just want to say thank you for everything. You've been an inspiration to me and so many other people. I am 14 years old, and I'd like to start a podcast. I have never done anything like this, and I'm very excited to start, as well as a little nervous. To record, I downloaded Audacity and bought the Marantz Pod Pack 1, which I saw on your channel. One question is, how do I address topics clearly? Also, how long should I talk for? Thank you so much, Bandrew. I hope you have a wonderful day and never stop doing what you do. Logan, thank you very much for the email. Those are some awesome questions, and I'll go ahead and give you my insight to them in two different parts. We'll start with how do you address topics clearly? And my advice here is going to be rather simple give you three points, and then we'll dive in a little bit deeper. First, cut out the fluff. Second, think through the topics prior to recording. And third, make an outline. So regarding cutting out the fluff, when I'm talking about something, the way that I approach it is, first, provide the facts that are important. Secondly, explain anything that may be confusing. Third, explain what this story means. Why are you talking about it? And fourth, then I will provide my input on the topic. So that's the outline or the guidance that I try to follow. Next, 
thinking through the topics prior to recording. If you want to be clear and concise, it's important to have your ideas formulated prior to recording because that really is the benefit of podcasting after all. You have time to process the news, think through it, and develop well thought out ideas. You're not in a breaking newsroom, so you're not getting news fed to you on the fly and you don't have to formulate your ideas while you're recording. So you have that time before you start recording, formulate the ideas and use that to your benefit. And lastly, we got make an outline. So when you're recording, it is really easy to skip around or skip over an important piece of information or go off on a tangent. That is a very common thing that you hear on podcasts where somebody starts talking about the history of pizza and then they'll go on a five minute tangent about how they love their anti anti M. I, I don't know, but I think it's really important to stay on topic if you are trying to provide concise information. Also, if you do have an outline, it will help you stay on topic and you will be much less likely to start rambling about something that no one cares about. Now, I will point out that I'm currently on like episode 130 of this podcast and I still don't follow these rules 100% of the time. It's something that I do have to still work on and think about actively when recording, making my outline and editing the podcast. So if you don't stick to these rules, don't beat yourself up. It is a process and everybody makes mistakes, everybody grows, and it will always take you time to develop skills and get really good at it. So next, how long should you talk for? This is a very, very hot topic in podcasting and people constantly say, make your podcast an hour. That's what all the successful people do. Or there's people saying, just make your podcast 20 minutes long because that's how long it takes for the typical person to drive to work. I don't think that matters at all. I personally don't care how long a podcast is. The, the thing that I've always said and the thing I've always done is make your podcast as long as it needs to be. So what I mean by that is if you only have 20 minutes of content, talk for 20 minutes. Do not have 20 minutes of content and then stretch out the podcast for an extra 40 minutes to meet some arbitrary length that people think podcast should be. This is another misconception that people have. We are not radio shows. We are not television shows. We do not have a set time that we need to record for or a set time length that our content has to be. That is another huge benefit. We have time to process the information that we're talking about, and we don't have any limits or constraints on the time that we have to fill with our podcast. So just make it as long as it has to be. And I think that will help you gain some trust or gain some respect from your listeners because they will notice that, hey, Logan is really respecting my time by not filling it with a bunch of nonsense. He's not giving me filler content. He's giving me the information that I came for in as short a time as possible, and that must mean that he respects me. So that's my advice for you. I hope that helps, and thank you for the awesome question. Best of luck on the podcast, and definitely let me know when it's live so I can check it out and give you some feedback. Next question comes from Pete. He says, hi, Bandrew. Have you ever used the Samson boom arms? More specifically, the Samson MBA 38 microphone boom arm. It's 50 bucks on Amazon and looks like the quality or build of the Rode PSA 1. There's really no reviews I could find online, only an archived Twitch review. Weird. If you haven't used Samson boom arms, have you used any Samson products? Are, the, are they quality products? Thanks. Appreciate you. Pete. So Pete, thank you very much for the question. Now, I personally have not used Samson's boom arms in the past, but I can tell you that I have had some really good experiences with their microphones. And on that note, their microphones are typically near the top of my recommended microphones list. For instance, the C01U Pro, I think that won the best USB microphone under hundred bucks. And then the most recommended microphone that I have put out there is likely the Samson Q2U. And if anybody from the Discord server is watching, hey, guess what? Q2U hype. Um, <laughs> so if their boom arms are the same quality as their microphones, I think you should be good with it. I looked it up on Amazon and I do really like the fact that there aren't any external springs on the boom arm to bump and cause that annoying rumbling noise that you hear with a lot of the newer boom arms. So it looks good to me. I've had good experiences with Samson, but being that I haven't used it directly, I can't 100% recommend it. I hope that helps. It looks good to me though. 
The next question comes from Gary. He says, hey, Bandrew, CL1U Pro or UMC202HD with the BM800? Which do you suggest? Thanks. Gary, thank you very much for the email. This is a very good question and a very difficult question. I think what it comes down to is that question that is posed far too often. Which one is better, XLR microphones or USB microphones? So what I mean by that is... If you do just want a microphone that's very limited but sounds better, go with the C01U Pro. Or if you want a microphone that sounds a little bit worse right now, but it does allow you more versatility, more upgradability, and a lot more modularity, go with the BM800 with the interface, the XLR cable, all of that stuff. Now, what I mean by that is with the XLR setup, if you want to down the road, you can replace the microphone. You can try out different XLR cables to see how they affect the sound. You could throw some inline processing with the DBX286S. You could throw a preamp on there. You can do so much more stuff with the XLR setup. Now, it does get more complicated. It can be more expensive once you start looking at higher end microphones or inline processing. But in my opinion, I think the XLR route is better because it will allow you to upgrade and play around with your audio a lot more in the future. So I guess my answer here really depends on an answer to a question that I will pose to you. Do you plan on sticking with whatever microphone or setup you buy for years, or are you going to upgrade down the road shortly? Like I said, if you do just want a microphone that you can set it and forget it and leave it there for years, go with the CL1U Pro because I do think it's better. But if you do think that shortly after upgrading or buying this stuff, I should say, you may consider upgrading maybe six months or a year, I think the XLR route is a much better way to go. So Gary, thank you very much for the email. I appreciate you. And I hope that gave you some insight and helped you make a decision on which route to go. And I hope somebody else got some use out of that question as well. And that is where we're going to wrap up today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and listening to this podcast. I guess I will see you all next week. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Vandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.